what, what was his what was his presence here like when did when did Paddy's when did Paddy come into your kind of consciousness first like as as a as a Gaelic as man as a fella from from back west or as a thing that you might imagine yourself is it just watching him playing with Kerry or was it that he was here and around and had that presence here not, not even so much that dear but like to, to us as kids and to me certainly in Scott never over the road here Matt Connor was my hero the, mm. the fella that was part of the Offaly team that beat Paddy and yeah. his, his teams in, in 82 Mikey Sheehy then you know um, Ogie Moran who lived for a while around here Paddy came with the cup once or twice and we knew he was ours, of course, but I th- and I, the reason for that is I think the Gaelic weren't that strong as club at the time in terms of okay. we were a, a novice team and Paddy, is by his own admission even, you know, wouldn't his commitment to the club wouldn't have been huge. He was very, very good training underage groups and that's, I suppose, where he first came into my on my radar. Um, he trained a group or two above me, year, about four years above me, you know, and we were saying, oh, Paddy Shea, the Kerry player, is in charge of the under-14s, you know, when you're nine or ten yourself, like, yeah. and that's when you first became aware of who this fellow was. It's not like I was here in Galrus watching him regularly, when I say Matt Connor was my hero, that's an awfully man, you just got a good footballer, and around here, Liz Bowl were the team at the time, it wasn't us, okay. it, was, it, it wasn't us, that came much later, um, Liz Bowl were the team that we looked Parading behind the band on the big days, um, the local team, and you did see party, but you also saw Tomaso Flaherty, Tommy Jim, loads of these lads that had given huge service to the club. But we weren't that strong, you know. Yeah. But there was a, a movement <coughs> coming underage that would make us stronger. But at the time, I suppose party's presence as a footballer in the colours of Ungaret wasn't that strong, you know. And it's part of local lore here, you know. At the times he was left in the sideline, even though he was a carry player, you know. <laughs> and, you know, there's a local lad here, Mossy Lord of Conor Hoor, to this day is you know, proud of the fact that he told Paddy, where am I playing today, pa- <laughs> Mossy, you're playing here on the sideline with me, like, you know, he said, that's, that's it. Yeah. And that would have been seen as bringing Paddy a pig or two down the course as well, like, because yeah. it was probably needed to be brought down, you know, just show up and don't train and just play the games together. But he wasn't a huge presence in our childhood, and that's being honest about it, you know. Yeah. Um, there were other footballers that were more glamorous to me anyway as a forward, I suppose, mm. you know. Did that change then with the Dublin rivalry and as it kind of come up through the eighties and, and and his legend was growing all the time? Like the the, the legend was always there, and I think if you talk to his colleagues today, you know the and we saw it ten years ago when he passed away the reverence that was there for him. We you know not that we needed to know that. I think of course the the eight All Ireland medals will never be taken away from those five players that. That won them, and the dubs of some of the dubs have emulated that now. Let's say, but they were the f- they were the five players with eight All Ireland medals, so that elevated them to a, a particular status within the county, even when they finished playing. But I think what Paddy brought to it afterwards, the minute he finished playing, he made no secret of the fact that he wanted to manage Kerry, and that you know Kerry were going through a bad patch, and the years were stretching from seven to eight to nine to ten to eleven until they eventually won another one on the field, and where Paddy was involved. But that's where Paddy's legend really got embellished, I think, um, where he very publicly and very vocally you know, went after the Kerry job, bald-headed mm-hmm. for, for years, and county board kept kicking him back, and he they eventually had to give it him, really. And when he did, he says, you know, he makes these famous statements about, you know, that he wanted, you know, one of his targets would have been trying to um, get a bit of spirituality back into Kerry football, and... God, we were laughing at it at the time. I had two or three years played at the senior team at the time, and we were bad. We, it's not that we were bad. We were just average. We were average, mm. and there was a group of young lads coming. There was incredible players playing. Underperforming or average? I think there was these small victories in the National League where we'd kind of go, OK, we're, we're starting to go places now, but in hindsight, we were just going through a, a fallow period. Club football was strong in the county at the time. Lauren Rangers won an All-Ireland club title in that period. The county championship was probably stronger than it is now mm. but probably the structure the belief the, the Mishnach had seeped out of us as players more so the generation above us lads that were older lads that had you know Cork were a very strong team at the time and Cork were managing to keep Kerry down in those late 80s early 90s the post Mick O'Dwyer era yeah. and the more that Cork were putting Kerry down the more vocal party was getting saying I should be given that job yeah. Not Mickey Ned, you know, Sullivan, not Ogie Moran, who you know, would have played alongside him. He wanted the job and he went 
took steps to, to get the job by being the under-21 manager, relatively successful at that, and I think that ensured that he got the job. And then you know, there was a sense that's when we really got to know Paddy, uh, us, like I personally, and you know, the Dara would have known him all his life, obviously they were quite tight, you know. Because mm. um, you played under him then? Because you played under him then, and that's when you got to see the magic, you know, I mean, on the greater scheme. Were you still going in the car with him at that stage? Well, from, from, the, word, from, from the word go, we, was, we were travelling in the car together, yeah, um, depending <laughs> on where in the country we'd be. I was in all those, for seven of those years, I was in Limerick during the year, and back West Kerry away then for the rest of the year, and sometimes it'd be a car full, sometimes it'd be just the two of us, mostly party driving, and sometimes me driving. Um, yeah. And like that, you, you get to know him to a point, I'm sure, you know. I always sense that of all the players and of all my contemporaries that knew him, that Dara really, you know, knew him and understood him. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were kind of kindred spirits, you know. <clears throat> I was surprised, or I am, I'm still surprised, or, yeah, I'm surprised at the notion, or, I suppose it's, it's hard to wrap your head around because in the national conscious, he was elevated to such a point yeah. so early as I began to understand those things that that pursuit of the job like there was a little bit of an attitude in yeah. the county board or, or, or just among maybe more established circles in the GA that sure we'll give it to him and see how big of a disaster he'll be and he, he won't want it again he, he, it, like he, he was, was perceived as a loose like cannon yeah he was yeah. perceived as a loose cannon and that that was unfair in him. And in was the, it? Yeah, that was very in terms of his ability to manage a football team. Mm. It would have been incredibly because was that after the fact? We look, you look back now. No, and say no. At the time. E- even at the, it was hard to understand at the time because this is a guy who had taken West Kerry teams out of the doldrums as a player manager in eighty four and eighty five and won two yeah. county championships. And again in nineteen ninety, he delivered as manager county championship. But he was just a year out of playing himself, and he said three county titles. West Kerry haven't won a county title since. Mm-hmm. You know, so obviously there was a force of personality thing there that this guy has the ability to bring people with him, to inspire people, to make them better players, and that's what he brought to the table when he became eventually a carry manager. He won, a, he was beaten in all Ireland on twenty one final as manager in nineteen ninety three. Had to bide his time. Ninety four, we weren't great on the twenty one. Cork beat us again. Cork were very strong as well. That you know that gets forgotten in the in the in the, in the narrative because Cork had really strong underage teams all those years that were feeding into a really good senior team that were all Ireland contenders of year 95 you win in on 21 all Ireland party delivers in that and as selector then the following year um, he, in his first year as senior manager he remained on as a kind of a selector Jack O'Connor and Seamus McGarrick were the, the joint managers for that so they were his group that he was feeding into you know already talented players like Morris Fitzgerald already talented players like a young Seamus Mine and you know and yeah Hard men like Breen, Eamon Breen, Liam Flaherty and these lads from North Kerry they were bringing that bit of steel that he would have admired and respected himself. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So he was always underestimated as a manager, even to the day of his, I suppose you'd call it a sacking. He was underestimated like that. You know, it was un- unfair, I suppose. There was a certain element of caricature there. Like, this is a guy who is a loose cannon, he's this, he's that. How could he have the smarts for the game of football? And the game was evolving. It's always interesting to see, you know, and you're, we're seeing it lately, I suppose, the managers, the profile of managers is getting older again. Like, You'd love to know what he would have been like into his 60s as a manager, what wisdom he would have brought to the table. Because he always had the classic characteristics of, you know, a lovely turn of phrase inside and just saying the right thing at the right time, inspiring people that way. Mm. Um, but people found it hard to accept that he could be tactically astute as well. You know, yeah. of course he made mistakes. Jesus, look at the players that we had at the time. We all made mistakes. Watch the football that was being played at the time. We were playing dumbass football a lot of the time. You know, it was in today's terms. Comparatively, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in today's terms. Like, you look at it and you cringe now. But that was the football at the time. What was missing in the early to mid-90s when we were going through those fallow periods of when Paddy eventually came was Paddy was the right man in the right place at the right time. It was just that... That bit, I suppose, of just that West Kerry Mishnah self-belief. He just didn't doubt himself. Mm. And that transferred onto players. Why shouldn't we win an All-Ireland? Mm. Why, why shouldn't it? And when you don't have one All-Ireland, that's very hard to believe. You know, so that takes a huge ability to inspire people to do that. And that's, that's what he brought to the table initially. And I think he became a better manager. I think his best performance ever, from my point of view, as manager, was in 2002, which is a very tough year for him. Pres- personally, he tragically lost his brother, Michal, the lad's father, that year. But after... That funeral, he was amazing right through at that back door somewhere when we went through the back door. He was he brought his 
his message to another level in terms of what it meant to play for Kerry and stuff like that. Stuff that probably doesn't get talking about now and yeah. all the kind of the analysis and the metrics yeah, and everything yeah, else. Yeah. It was yeah. it was of its time, you know, and that's th- that's what you remember. Do you know the way they say you don't remember really how good managers were, what they did, what it's how they made you feel. Mm. Hunter Collins, like, like you'd have a better, uh, you'd be a little bit older, so you'd have a better kind of a, an understanding of, of some of the. Do you know, when I was when you're 16 or 17, you're not thinking about these things in, in, in that way, but sometimes I think it's like the metrification, or even sometimes the middle class values that are coming that 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 are that have welcomed into the game now, but even at that time to look at a force like Pawdy and it's so wild and so dangerous comparatively comparatively to a safety. Yeah. And so we're like we just get the the lad who goes in with the suit and he's like has everything figured out and there's no presentation. There's, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. no there's no so then you look at a lad like Pawdy then you say, but you know, he could he can't fill that. There's too much uncertainty and we don't want any uncertainty and yet that uncertainty that comes in like there's a lovely thing in uh, I suppose in, in, like in, in a ritual versus a ceremony in a ceremony it's like going, like in mass you know like you know what's going to happen at every yeah. stage it's all planned out so there's no room in a sense for any magic to come in and then with a ritual they say like you, you plan 50% of it because you want to leave the door open now that means you're walking the gauntlet but yeah. it might not work so yeah. there may be a problem and it may, and it may not work Whereas it seems like for somebody like Potty, if there's space for some magic to come in, he's like a lightning rod for it. Yeah. yeah. And so things can happen. And, and, and those things are disallowed by the structure of the organisation or something, you know? Yeah. And, and that bit of wildness that he probably did bring to it was probably there in the first year of his management with us, where, you know, each mini victory was celebrated, <laughs> over celebrated, maybe. But at the same time, that's what bought him, I suppose, the loyalty of players when the when the shit did hit the fan later on that year and maybe his famous in the final and the the so called famine extends into ten years in Kerry and you know, this lunatic is managing these these boys and you know, there's a bit of socialising going on and stuff like that. So for the following winter, into October, November, December, like, you know, he made himself promises and we made promises like that, you know, we everything would be left out there, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, it was, everything was going to get thrown into it, like, and I think it was one of those years in Mars, Mars was sort of famous, he got the award at the end of that year for his performances, like, but he personally, Morris himself, you know, put everything into that year, into that winter, there was, was no excuses by anybody at training, and whatever we were asked of, it was the hurt from that defeat in 96, and the lashing that Paddy got publicly, and yeah. he, in fairness, he, he, I'd say, made, made efforts to take that lashing upon himself so that he spared the players, you know. Um, and was it, was it that, that they saw him doing that, or was there enough coming through in his management at that stage that fellas took to it? Like, because, you, you know, you, you, you can have a manager who could get a bit of hardship, but it's, it's almost, that's the break point where players can be opt out a little bit of defending and what they seem to have, like, where does that promise come from within the players? Is it for Paul, is it just promise they made themselves by Paulie kind of asking them to make it, or were, did that just take it on upon themselves to do it? Well, for famous, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a cliche to this day, like, the, 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 the level of, a program that comes on and carry when you lose a big game, you know. I, I don't know what it's like in other counties, I never will. But in, in, in our county, like it, it gets pretty horrible, like. and that was all there in, in, in late '96 into the autumn '96, even though we won a second in the 21 in a row. I think that's probably what kind of saved the younger lads. And he said, Look, we're, we're definitely going somewhere here, like, you know, just more. And, and you know, there were. Plenty of strong personalities on that team, you know, the likes of Seamus Mine and these lads, you know, they would say, you know, their answer to stuff would always have been, let's get bigger, better, faster, more, you know, okay, you're doing 100 press ups, I won't do 100, I'll do 1,000, not 200, 300, I'll do it, you know. And <clears throat> we, a lot of us were, I suppose, training in Cork and Limerick and places like that where we were seeing this, like, you know, saying, what's the standard and how can we go beyond it? 
and that's definitely what happened in 97 and Pardee set the example, you know, he, he lived like a monk himself in those months like, it, until we got the wagon back on, you know, the reins again into the league, win the National League and then you have definitely a sense, I remember Pardee saying at one stage in one of his speeches, you know, there's an all Ireland in us. I, I can feel it in my piss, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's the first time I heard that, you know, I feel it in my water or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just said, yeah. And it was just these little turns of phrases that we, you know, some of, some of them, you know, I hate talking about stuff that's said in dressing rooms. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah because yeah. that's something we need to hold back on always. Like, But there are certain things that are worth revealing like that and you're not saying anything, you know. But his his... his his turn of phrase was so colourful every night as you went in there was something new and yeah. I don't know I'm sure he was getting coached himself somewhere I don't know where it was coming from but he, he no uh, I don't think so I don't know he, he was he, not, I won't say co I suppose coach is the wrong thing I think what being he, inspired by you see in what? hindsight when you, when you think of Paddy like he comes home to become a public and leaves the garage like as a young man like, and goes home to become a public and runs cruisers for into the queen for a number of years and in that environment you're being exposed to unbelievable storytellers, unbelievable people mm -hmm. and it, I suppose maybe part of his culture that he mightn't have had himself like over in Torch to John Charles and the back of the day then he kind of gets into the, the latter stages of his playing career and he becomes a public and in his own native patch and he's listening to stories the whole time he's listening to these lads and that was one thing I do remember about Paulie always he'd listen intently to the way things were said as much as about how they were said and he might come along and month or two later what they were said and what yeah, they were said like and he might come along a month or two later and say, you said to me a while ago that, da 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 I said, did I? You know. <laughs> and he, 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 was, he was a good listener like that. And I'd say he learned an awful lot from his time behind the bar and cruisers and in Paddy's own pot, you know, from the people, from the customers. But he, he had such a way with words in a pre-match speech or in a pre-training session or a post-training session speech that there was always an awareness there that there was something, you know, that you're playing for Kerry here, that, 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 that there's something bigger than just winning the match next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had that big picture language all the time throughout that year in 97, you know. Um, like, it was so much so to the point, like, I remember, I don't do it anymore, but I, I kept a diary of all that, like, you know, I wrote down what, he's, what Paddy said tonight. That's how much under his spell I was, I suppose, at the time. You know, and again, those things won't do but I have him at home, it's 25 years ago now, you know, and I just come home from training, so I used to be travelling with him, what he said, what he what he said to us afterwards, what he said about the next opposition. Is that as valuable to you, is that book as valuable to you as the medal? Yeah, absolutely, more so, more so, more so. Wow. More so. The med Again, I don't want it to become a cliche, but parties, mm. eight medals famously in a biscuit tin, and that's not being disrespectful to the winning of those medals, it's not about that, yeah, it's yeah. not about that, it never was. Maybe we thought it was when we were trying to win them. But when you have them in your hand, you kind of say, they're only representative of something that took years to achieve, you know. And putting them in a biscuit tin isn't being disrespectful to the opposition or to anybody else that did, doesn't have them. But what it, it, it's, it's what to say, how you felt about it, what it meant. Like, because like, when, you, when you're going to be on your deathbed someday, you, the medals are, you can't bring the medals with you, you know. But... The, the nourishment that we got from, from, you know, that period of your life, from, from, my, from what, in my case, from 18 years of age to 28, 29 years of age, we were, you know, under Paul uh, regime as manager or whatever, like, there was an awful lot in that. It was a very formative period of my own life, you know, in terms of big life decisions happening. You know, your, your first job, your, your, your future wife, your, your, new, your first car, all that thing. Yeah involved Paulie directly for me you know so that's how much of an impression he left I, somebody else could have probably done it but it so happens it was Paulie at the time and he was of his time and of his place and for me he was a huge part of it like, and you know on the greater scheme of things 10 years isn't a big part of a man's life but it left, just left such an impression on me that you know we're still talking about him and in the, in the last couple of weeks even I was visiting Michal O'Shea a great friend of Paulie's and he used to walk in the radio with me and you know we Conversation always comes back to party, and we have loads of other stuff to talk about. <laughs> loads of other stuff to talk about. Yeah, but it always comes back to party, and there's always a laugh, and there's always that kind of wistful ah, at the end of it, you know. And that's there's an awful lot in that, you know. Mm. You're saying, "Jesus, imagine what he," you know. Th th there's a lot of regret there, you know. Mm. And um, but you know, it's always filled with laughter, you know. And 
The funny thing that Michal Shea said to me recently, I was over in his house, he said, you'd always think of a story that you thought you'd forgotten about. <laughs> and, it's that stage that just comes kind of organically like a wood over a couple of pints. Like, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And yeah, he yeah. said, did you hear that one? And I said, just no, I never heard that one. You know, and that, that's, that's what he brought, you know, to it, like, you, you know, um, to a training session, to a, a spin in the car, to a trip to the bar or whatever, you know, mm. that, that's it. And I'm sure a lot of people are like that, but, you know, for better or for worse, those 10 years were, for, for me anyway, were full of story, so much so that I felt the need to write them down, you know. Is he distinguishable from Kerry or from the figure that he is in, in, in the, in, well, particularly the GA psyche, but the, the Irish GA psyche, we'll say, which, all, which everybody feels they have a degree of ownership. Yeah. Over Paddy from the lads who'd come down here for the summer and they say, Oh, geez, I remember the time I met Paddy and everyone had a story about Paddy. Yeah. What about for somebody of this place? Was there a pride in the fact that he was also of this place? Whether um, he was. Of course there was. Of course, there, he was a huge part of it. And again, it's a kind of a small footballing regret more so than anything else. In the years that we had huge success as a club that went all the way to all Ireland final. The senior living in St. Patrick's Day 2004, the party wasn't part of that because he would have been an awful lot to contribute to it. I think it was at a time where he had been removed from the carry job and he was hurting badly. But there was a pride in himself at our achievements that time and it would have been great. The people that were with us at the time were brilliant and they delivered an awful lot to us, but it would have been great to have used his wisdom as well, like, you know, on, on that journey. He was always of this place. There'll always be kind of little internecine squabbles between the parishes around here and stuff. Oh, he belongs to the Oh yes, Count Traw, I'm from the north side up here on the, the other end of the peninsula. And historically, you know, it would have been hard to pull a belt of team together, you know, because there are different personalities there. But there was yeah. huge pride in where Dollar is here and you know, that he was one of our own. His picture is on the wall inside there. You know, Louise Lee Worthy is the latest picture to you going up there hopefully. But you know, the people that you know brought honour to the area, to the club and you know, she's when you win it all in the medals and you when two was a manager and delivered three county championships to West Kerry, you know, and that's just naming some of the things. He brought huge honour to the place. He was always helpful when it, when it came to fundraising and stuff like that, you know. But um, in my time, he would have never managed the senior teams. He would have helped out before I started playing senior and stuff like that. Mm. But um, he's, he'll always be one of our own. He'll always be a huge pride in him. You know, the fact that his nephews and his son now is one of the main players and all, and all people that link will always be there. Right back, you know, it's amazing that the link goes 50 years and beyond back that there's no shade from all the world in a way that Jersey out playing with all of us. It's funny to see Padre Gog, like, there's just something in the, the body of them, yeah. the way they play. Like, it's, I, it's almost like your quintessential footballer, like, in the way maybe Tommy Welch was a quintessential hurler, like, that there's a, do you know, isn't there a thing with, I look at the World Cup now, like the the Argentinians believe in a kind of a deity, a footballing deity, yeah, and, yeah. and he's and he's small, and he's and, and he's able to <laughs> jig at the Maradona yeah, or yeah, Messi, yeah. even if he yeah. grew up outside of it. And there's something about the, the shape of them as football. Now, the as a particular, as a, as a wing back or a midfielder, yeah. or, you know, as, maybe it's maybe it's not your your stylish corner forward, but there's a a Kirkwiga in the gadget there, there, the, there's the, a gadget about yeah but again you wouldn't want it to overshadow the fact that they put an awful lot into it probably more than most you know mm. in terms of time preparing the body and the run and the, to you know like they that. were superb athletes like, yeah, you know yeah. they, they all embraced hard training you know they didn't shirk it and um, I think again Paul you set the example there you know the the, 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 the stuff running over the Pesach and all that and you know whipping the body into shape after maybe a, a decent yeah, yeah, winter yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff it, it, would, it, 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 it wouldn't it wouldn't work now you know wintering well as they say that doesn't work anymore you yeah. know but again the, the mentality to do that to torture yourself you know over the course of a, an early spring and to be right for the big days you know that mentality would be there in all the O'Shea's Darren particularly you know, kind of the big day the big yeah, day yeah, you know yeah. the vibration yeah, yeah yeah the bigger the bigger the stage you know that, that's the, that's the mentality and it's in them and it's you know, we played an intermediate final about five years ago when we last won the intermediate and it was part of the goal was man of the match. And you know, he was decent enough all year but from the final was man of the match. They they, they, they always arrived for the big day well, well prepared, you know. Yeah. Is the, is the 
a legacy like just read reading the articles and kind of you end, you end up down these cliched kind of roads and you hear a lot of the same stuff kind of spoken about or whatever and I suppose yeah it's interesting what you're saying about the the, the unwillingness to really reveal too much uh, was it do you think it was something that Paddy created like what I would term I know it's a term that probably annoys a lot of people but the sacredness of the dressing room like you can't dis- you, you don't stand up at the start of the year and say this is like you know we're, we're going to deepen the spirituality of the mm. team we're going to have a sacred dressing room it's it is either sacred it is or, or it's not yeah. Yeah. and somebody has to carry that yeah. debt in and I mean it, it sounds it sounds for all intents and purposes like that's what Paddy brought like he brought that scale to the point where you'll often talk about it uh, even when I'm talking to you got up in the car to Galway or whatever Lit stories on the side but it's more references to the crack or references to some of the stuff that he'd get up to but you never reveal too much either because it seems like there's just something that should be guarded because of the quality uh, there's, of it. There's something you can't shine a light on everything you know I mean you can kind of ex- like you know when that documentary came out and marooned um, the West Meeting and I said, geez, I'm surprised Paddy did that, you know. And it was, of course, it was a brilliant documentary. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. You get to, a, an inclination, maybe an indication of the, you know, what kind of colour he brought to the a training session or a post match speech or whatever like that, you know. But there's some of it kind of should be held back always, mm. you know, because that's yours, that particular group. The 1917, we were out in Club Park this year, for example, you know, 25 years ago, and everybody we said, geez, where did 25 years go? And the, the sadness was that the men, the fellow that led us there, you know, and there was a group of lads, including Jack O'Connor, who was a selector, and James McGarry from this club was, you know, joint manager, Bernie O'Callaghan and Tom, Tom O'Connor from Clemere. They all contributed, but there was no doubt about who was the, the count there and the head, the head on the show, you know. Yeah. And there's some of that, you know, that should remain sacred. You know, that was of our time. And there'd be a fear always that you, if you say, you know, what was said or what was done, that you might appear less maybe mystical then you know you might take away some of Paulie's mystique that's not the case it's just I, I believe that you know what he, what he said at the time how he brought 30 different personalities and forged them together you know some of those fellas you know as I said we had a reunion we all respect each other we, we're not great mates not like we go play golf together and like other teams do or go on holidays together stay. we do hardly in touch with each other you know yeah. but that for a particular window of time in Paddy's case, a number of years, like, but in particular, 97, where he forged sort of personalities that really barely speak to each other today, not through any animosity or anything like that, but just that's the way life happens. Like, that he managed to bring us all together, these kind of disparate personalities, to, to, you know, to the point that where you would do anything for the guy next to you. Know? That's what good managers do. That's what, I'm sure there are stories from 32 other counties around the country that have a manager that did that, you know, but in our case, you know. Paul, you just brought that bit extra to it, I think. Would you, is there a chance you would be in more contact if Paul was still alive? I don't think so. I think it's the nature of Kerry anywhere. You know, there's North, South, East and West, Tralee, Killarney, and there's always these little petty animosities and you get on with the rest of your life when you finish playing them anyway, you know. I mean, you, you could be playing a game here in, with the Belt, if you, you know, against some of your best friends back in the day. You take the head off them, yeah, you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's the way it should be, you know. Yeah. I was always fascinated by these teams that stayed in touch, and I suppose that's, you know, it's the old question of when does a team stop being a team? You know, the, the 97 team will always be part of team. The 2000 team will always be part. You know, we won a certain amount together, but there was years in between we didn't win a whole lot either, and you know, you feel the same respect for those lads, you know. Yeah. But how do you create that magic you know within a group Jim Gavin obviously has something you know Pat Gilroy obviously had something in 2011 to bring you know a team that had underachieved to the point where he bought them yeah but for us we can't experience anything other than what we've experienced in the party you know and subsequently you compare them to what Jack O'Connor brought to the table or before that Opie Morton brought to the table and they were my managers in my time playing with Kerry mm-hmm. so um, you know I mean Jack O'Connor earns that respect as well. Ogie Moran was a brilliant guy, a brilliant manager, but we weren't ready, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And for eight years of my senior inter-county career, Paddy was the man there. Mm-hmm. And 
his legend kind of lives on and gets probably embellished, I suppose, by different narratives since as well, yeah. like, which, you know, there's a statue to him outside his own pub. And that was done by his own community as well. It was important yeah. for them that it would be there. You know, it's not, there was never a sense that, oh, it'll be a great tourist attraction, which it obviously has become, you know. But certain people, I suppose, John Egan down his name, saying, you know, the Goodwire and Morgan, you know, the statue, the, the beautiful statue. Honour the contribution. Like. Yeah, yeah. And there's a statue inside in Tralee that honours the game itself, you know, like jumping for a ball at a roundabout. It's brilliant. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful, you know. It is beautiful. Um, and and that, that means a lot, like, you know, and I'm, I hope to put, you know, Paddy's family and parish over, you know, that statue of Paddy will remain there forever, like, and you just kind of say, Jesus, he was one of us. He was... You know, he was iconic, he was brilliant, like, but he was probably shaped more devoted, you know. And while, like, when she affected got here in Ardvohar, like, on site, uh, like, the Imran that mm. GA people seem to be on when they get to the statue, there's something... Yeah. <laughs> there's something realised, or for a brief moment they're touching something that they remember yeah. that they remember deeply about their, maybe something that impacted them in the, in the I, late 70s, 80s watching him play or as a manager what he defied and how he I, I'm sure that's there and I'm sure there's people coming out of a pub half cut as well and just say just <laughs> a little bit of fun and having a picture you know yeah. you can yeah. you can have a deep and meaningful perspective on it from, from my point of view I find it very hard to go over there now you yeah. know um, you know it's, it's, it's not that we don't socialise that much anyway and, you know you're at a stage you're like but you know, there, there's a lot of memories in that pub, like, and there's a lot, you know, that statue, you know, mean an awful lot to when you see it. Um, and, you know, it, it's just, it's a different place now, of course it is, you know. And, you know, they're a great family over there, and they used to come across part of the road with more ambulance, like, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, would you be, are you cross with him? Would you be cross with him? Uh, cross is a funny old... Funny old mammies were there was a few, the there was a few like, times I was cross with him when, <laughs> when he wouldn't pick beer he would have, because do you know he would have, they would have, he would have got a lot of abuse I suppose over the years for picking belt at lads and then I suppose you know he, he would have it would have been easy to have a uh, you know he would have been harder on his own on, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on his nephews and stuff like that when criticism was to be shipped out like and, you know uh, same with myself like and, you know I suppose it didn't really go down well in certain places and where, where, where my selection on the team might not always been automatic like I might have got the nod ahead of maybe somebody from Tralee or from Glary that's the yeah. nature of it that's always going to, that's always going to be the case but cross with party it's just it, it doesn't you know it's like the old Pink Floyd song wish you were here kind of a thing you know yeah, um, yeah, for yeah, certain yeah. milestones in, in the club here and stuff like that you know and um, you know it, that's all, that regret is always there when somebody you know passes to, to a young man too soon you know is there a um, kind of you know burning out instead of a fading away? Would a, was it that size of a character that it was like almost? <sighs> it'd be a convenient. It'd, it'd be a like, convenient narrative, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> it's hard to imagine. You know, you're 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 entering a, a different arena there, where you're just kind of saying, I "Wonder what he'd be like now when he was." I remember somebody said to me. Couple of years ago, yeah, you mean pension age? No, sixty-five. You know, I was like, yeah, it's hard to imagine him like you know. Um, what would he have been like? You know, he, he would have been a grandfather. You know, he, he, his his own kids of kids. You know, you know, and mm. it, it 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 was. You know, he 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 blazed a great trail for the fifty-seven years he was there. He wasn't going to you know ever you know go quietly like. And he, I do believe it. And I've I've seen members of his own family say he was an innately shy man. Mm. But I'd say he kind of overcame that. You know. Over the course of his football career, and you know, particularly, I think I think his time in cruisers and in, in, and in the pub definitely, to, you know, helped him along in that regard as well. Like you know, to this apparently super confident kind of a guy that didn't doubt himself that we all saw as a as a you know as a, as a manager over those, over those years. Like, but I'd often wonder, you know, like the, I think Dara, his nephew, would be very understood him better than most. They had that kind of mischief in them. They had that sense of humour. They had that. You know the the black magic in them, you know, and yeah. that, that you know that kind of you know that they that would probably be a better place to talk about that element of it, like you know, yeah, because yeah. for me, my relationship was with Paddy was for, for ten years, you know, as a, as a as a passenger, as a as a player and manager relationship, and uh, you know he 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 helped me an awful lot, like say in, in different ways, like you know, over the course of the time he was manager in Kerry, like, yeah.
Was there a time when it was like, like vintage party, like in the dressing room? Oh, you know what I mean? Like, like a moment, like a moment in time where you're like, like someone said it to me recently, like where where you're reminded that you're in the moment, like where where you're reminded that you're alive, like you saw a party oh, yeah. and it brought you into something that was like just bigger than, yeah, than what yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, his 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 turn of phrase, his speeches stand out. You know, and as I said in, in two thousand and two, where he he was just amazing, and he gave a speech before the eleven final. In 2002, the, the day before and the night before, and we'd always two were, we were wired to the moment, and, you know, what it meant to play for Kerry, and um, you know, different indicators and from his own personal life of what it meant to play for Kerry, you know. But then the other side of it, let's say six pre- years previously in 1996, I remember playing the Tipperary in Championship game in a wet day above in Clarmel, and there was no showers up in the dressing room afterwards. But before the game in Bream, our wing back, and with those days there was no. Um, Whatever tags we had had no lining in them, so you'd have to plan a pair of jocks inside the tags. Like, and Aidan Green had left his, his jocks at home, like, and he said, oh, 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 Jesus, I said, No jocks. Paddy says, I'll give you mine. <laughs> <laughs> so Aidan thought about it for a split second, of course, Paddy peeled off his wife and said, Paddy had this great stance inside in the dressing room, and again, not reading him, you know, where he'd be fuck naked, but just totally unself conscious, like, yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. Paddy threw him the. the the, the, the wife runs anyway, Green for the fights. Yeah. <laughs> Tagged open, played a game in driving rain, awful day and all like in Cloud Mill. Like, you know, championship game, May 1996. Played a full game, 70 plus minutes, whatever. Soaked to the skin, come back, no showers working afterwards. So we're all kind of cursing that there's no showers. How could this happen? Championship game. And we're all just wiping out toads. And then ah, from across the, the, the dressing room, party makes a roar at Green. Hey, man, have you my jocks? <laughs> and of course he had like, yeah, but they're soaked, Paddy. Give them to me. <laughs> Paddy put on the jocks again. <laughs> Over the be- beige trousers. And after a couple of seconds, you could see the, the, the dampness coming out through the beige trousers. Just like, but it's just typical. You know, something that just gives you an idea of small little colour on Paddy. Like, you know. Yeah. And we were all just going, what kind of a room is this fella like? You know, there yeah. was no... There was no sense of, that, like, the right thing to do is not look for the jacks back, obviously. Right? But, <laughs> I get on yeah. the phone the follow week. Yeah, yeah. But Green was just fascinated, and we, as we all were. Saying, Jesus, like, I surely, you know, you won't put them on, but he did. Walk down the street and go home. There's something, there's some players get to a certain size uh, in, like, you know, where it's they're recognisable everywhere in their household names no matter where they go they're kind of reminded the Gooch is constantly yeah. and will forever be reminded he's the Gooch and Henry Shefflin will constantly and forever be reminded that he's Henry Shefflin and there seems to be a great battle that many mm. past players of that stature go through to ever be able to release themselves from how the public hold them and how everybody in their that they meet holds them and sometimes you forget so it can come at the cost and what you get stuck a little bit I think in the, you, you can at least are the ideal conditions that I think to get stuck in, in the ego of, of, yeah. of, of what that creates to have the the humour uh, like the, the, the willingness when you hear some of the stories about the type of po- the type of humour the party had and, and then stories like that with the jocks like in standing and being totally non-self-conscious mm-hmm. He was ripe to be ruined by ego, yet it doesn't sound like it governed a huge amount of what he did when it came to the the real quality. Like, of, I'm not saying it was; it, it had to have been there because he was in such yeah. circles. Maybe I don't know. I don't know, but I, I think when it comes down to it, football, was meant so much. He, you know, the game itself. He loved it. He loved the game. He loved. It. You know, the sound of a thud of a 50 coming off the ground, you know, he loved, he was able to spot little nuances, you know, if you were carrying an injury and the way you were running after coming back from an injury, you know, he was like, I suppose, what you a horse trainer would recognise the way a horse kind of behaves, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Um, he had that innate sense and he just loved the game, you know, so no matter where the conversation might turn towards drag music or, you know, good pubs or, you know, whatever, um, it all came back to football for Paddy and Kerry. He just, he'd love him. Kerry, 
you know, and I think he tied that in with football, that Kerry was about football, and obviously there's more to Kerry than football, but he, he really engaged with that legend of Kerry as being a football county, you know, and that mm. playing for Kerry was the greatest honour you could have as a Kerry man or woman. And, you know, winning in All-Ireland with Kerry and doing it in Dublin, and he loved the notion of going up to the big smoke and yeah, you know, yeah. taking on the big teams in their, in their own backyard and kind of that notion of, and going back then to Kerry again, like in, you know, driving home through Dingle in the middle of November when there's nobody around and the rain is pelting off the window and listening to maybe Noel Hill or Tony McMahon or James Begley and Cooney, you know, yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that kind of thing and watching, you know, he was always, obviously in the last particularly 20 years, it was like looking out to see how the tourism trade was and, you know, who was doing well and what, how, who was selling crab claws and who wasn't and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, putting yeah. up signs saying John Spillane playing tonight who bugged the donkey and Paul Shea's Pope and little <laughs> battles with the <laughs> county council about those signs and stuff like that. There was always that bit of divinment, like, but I don't think Paul was ever going to lose himself because he had a very fair sense of who he was. It's a football was, was huge, I like, think. He was a good footballer that invested a lot of time in football and in footballers. And that's why the heartbreak was so huge, I think, when Kerry released in that time, you know, because he was tied up very much, his identity was tied up very much with being somebody who contributed to Kerry football and to the county in Kerry. Yes.